Hello and welcome to another Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review. We're up in the air on a bumpy day and we're heading off to Barton Aerodrome near Manchester. The purpose of the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review is to inspire you to visit new places and to share useful information that will make your arrival and departure safe and trouble free. Barton is a grass airfield just five miles to the northwest of the city centre in Manchester. It's sometimes known as City Airport or City Heliport. The main runways are 26 left and 26 right, and 08 left and 08 right. Their takeoff distances range between 626 and 641 metres, so they're quite short. 20 and 02 have a takeoff distance of 518 metres, and 32 and 14 has a takeoff distance of 398 metres. From a pilot's perspective, though, the biggest notable point about Barton is the airspace that surrounds it. It sits underneath the Manchester CTA and adjacent to the Manchester CTR. I'm coming from the south, and from that direction, it's usually accessed using the Manchester Low Level Route, a corridor of Class D airspace that has special VFR access rules. Now, I'm going to be a Manchester Low Level Route virgin. Uh, those that know me know that I'm not a fan of, of flying at low level, but it is the easiest way to get to Barton Aerodrome. Uh, but we're going to do it, we're going to think about it, we have thought about it in advance, and our routing is, has been chosen to avoid some of the gotchas with this airspace when coming into Barton. I'm going to show you my arrival at Barton and my flight up the low level route. But before I do, I just want to thank AOPA UK for sponsoring the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review. AOPA UK cares about our aerodromes, our aeroplanes and this wonderful pastime called flying that you and I enjoy. AOPA UK works really hard to speak up on behalf of pilots, owners, operators, aerodromes and aviation businesses at government and regulatory level. I'm a member of AOP UK and I think it's really important that we support associations like them to make sure our rights and freedoms are preserved. Right now, AOP UK is offering Flying Reporter followers a massive 25% discount on new one-year and two-year memberships. Click the link that pops up, the one that's in the description, or use the QR code to find out more. The discount link is also on the Flying Reporter website if you want to check that out later. The thing about the low-level route is you have to go through it below 1,300 feet. You have to squawk their conspicuity code, not 7,000, or you'll be done for an infringement. And you have to listen to the Manchester uh, frequency, uh, 118.580. Uh, and you have to be VFR at the moment in Class D airspace. I say at the moment because the whole route is under review. If you're planning to travel this way, do make sure you use current official forms of aeronautical information. Don't rely on this video alone when planning for your flight. As we know, things in aviation have a habit of changing a lot, sometimes with little effective communication. So at the moment, this route is Class D airspace. So if you're in VMC, Class D VFR UK rules apply, and so you must be clear of cloud with the surface in sight below an indicated airspeed of 140 knots and with a minimum in-flight visibility of 5 kilometres for fixed-wing aircraft. There is an exemption for the low-level route which allows you to fly through it without a controlled airspace clearance, so long as you squawk 7366, listen to the Manchester radar frequency and fly not above 1,300 feet on the Manchester Q&H. On entering the route, be sure to be at the right altitude, listening and squawking, and don't clip the corners. Just setting the wrong squawk code can result in a call or letter from the CAA. Accurate use of your transponder is as important when you turn to leave the low-level route as well. One of the gotchas is coming out, um, sort of making a right turn, an easterly turn towards Barton, sort of two-thirds of the way up the low-level route, um, and switching squawk and changing frequency while still in the low-level route. The condition of of transiting that bit of the Class D is you have to remain on the listening watch, you have to be using the squawk. Um, 
so don't change too early. And the way that we're going to get around that today is, well, one of the reasons is, we're going to go all the way to the north and we're going to clear the low level route and then come back in. Because the reason for doing that, and I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I'm being overcautious, but this is what I'm looking at this, this is what I've chosen to do. The reason for going out to the north and then coming back in is it also gives me plenty of time to establish contact with Barton and listen to them. Lots of people find themselves thundering towards Barton leaving the low-level route, not enough time to make contact and get a picture of what's going on. So I'm going to leave the low-level route to the north and then re-enter uh, from the, from the north-west, uh, heading towards Barton in Class G airspace. It might sound to you as a sensible plan, but as one of my military friends used to say, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and the enemy today is the weather, as you'll find out. Quite a bit of weather around today. Um, and very windy, but I'm uh, doing my best. To be flying at the correct altitude for this route, Zero, one, seven. I need the Manchester QNH, and I get that from the Manchester arrival ATIS frequency. The reported cloud ceiling at Manchester to the southeast of Barton is 1,900 feet, but looking ahead, there may be lower cloud to the north. So we're beginning our descent now to 1,200 feet to uh, enter the low-level route. Copy the Victor, request frequency change to Manchester, listening Squawk, uh, 118.580. Copy the Victor, Roger, Squawk is required and 3-4 Manchester, good day. Good day, Copy the Victor. Blue Mark 6926, turn right heading 335. Turn 335, Blue Mark 6926. So we're just about to enter the zone at, uh, we've got Windsford Flash over here. Um, Alton Park is over there, and we're heading northerly, or we're tracking northerly. And we're next looking for the M56 Junction 10, which is about halfway up the route. And we're obviously trying to keep, well, we're, we've got to keep below 1,300 feet. The low-level route is just four miles wide. There are no line features to follow, and flying it using dead reckoning alone would be a challenge, I'd say, so a moving map will certainly be advisable here. I've turned on my landing light to make me more conspicuous to opposite direction traffic, and I'm flying at a slow cruise speed today. But there is no rule or convention about how to position your flight within the route. You can fly to the left, to the right, or straight down the middle. What you do need to consider, though, is having sufficient space to avoid other traffic, while at the same time remaining within these tight confines, both vertically and horizontally. On reaching Warrington, I noticed that my plan to route north to first leave the low-level route is not going to work out today. Uh, having said I was going to go this way, I'm changing my mind because the weather's worse up to the north um, and it's quite built up here, which I hadn't, appreciate, hadn't appreciated. I'm going to leave here at the Thelwall Viaduct. That means I must ensure I'm outside of the Class D before switching squawk code and frequency. Barton information, Golf Bravo Mike, India Victor, five miles to the southwest inbound, request aerodrome information. Golf Bravo Mike, India Victor, Barton information, hello. Uh, score, runway 26 right, circuit's right hand, QFE 1019er. Uh, if you clear the low level route, squawk 7365. Roger, got Squawk 7365, uh, 26 right, right-hand circuit, uh, QFE 1019, confirmed, Golf India Victor. Golf India Victor, AFM, QFE 1019. QFE 1019, Golf India Victor. Golf India Victor, just say again, altitude. Uh, currently, altitude 2,300 feet, Golf India Victor. Uh, cor correction, 1,300 feet, Golf India Victor. 
So as you can see, there's very little time to make contact now with Barton. We're almost at their ATZ boundary and have only just received the aerodrome information. On a busy day, we might have to hold here or try and route further north, weather permitting, before making our approach towards the ATZ. We mustn't enter the ATZ without first obtaining the aerodrome information from the FISO unit. That will also land you in trouble with the CAA. It's been a point of contention this, as many of you will know. We'll talk to the aerodrome manager about the strict enforcement of Rule 11 of the Rules of the Air later in this video. Fuel is on, radio's tuned, engine temperatures and pressures are in the green. Direction indicator is aligned. Switch to the fullest tank now. Golf India Victor, just to confirm, sir, how do you intend to join? Uh, intend to join uh, right hand down when runway 26 right. Golf India Victor. Golf India Victor, Roger. Uh, there's no reported traffic to affect that. Report downwind. We'll go, Golf India Victor. Item 6C of Rule 11 of the Rules of the Air also mandate that you should state your position and height on entering the ATZ. I've been told to report downwind, and so that, in my view, supersedes the Rule 11 requirement. Brakes, undercarriage, mixture, fuel, landing light, carpet, doors. Golf India Victor, right hand downwind, runway 26 right to land. Golf India Victor, roger, no reported traffic ahead, report final. We'll go, Golf India Victor. The cloud ceiling is preventing me from conducting an overhead join today. If you were doing an overhead join, at the time of publication of this video, the overhead join height is 1,700 feet to give you a buffer from the Class D airspace above us at altitude 2,000 feet. Just watch your descent dead side because the ATZ is clipped by the Manchester CTR. As you can see, flying into Barton, there's quite a lot to potentially catch you out. If you're flying in here, definitely don't just wing it. Golf India Victor, final runway 26 right to land. Golf India Victor, runway 26 right, surface wind 270 degrees, 21 knots, gusting 32. Land at your discretion, caution bird activity on the runway. Number 10. Landing Golf India Victor. With the wind the way it is today, there is a fair chance I may have to go around. If that were needed, I'd have to position to the dead side of the runway because of helicopters operating up to 500 feet on the live side. Also, for this same reason, I mustn't turn crosswind until reaching a circuit height, 1,000 feet. India Victor, welcome to Barton. Uh, take your next left turn to vacate. Next left to vacate, Golf India Victor. After landing at Barton, do taxi with care. The runway and taxi surfaces can be quite uneven here, and there's actually a bit of history that explains why that is. The aerodrome opened in 1930 and it was actually the first municipal airfield in the UK to be licensed by the Air Ministry and back then it was Manchester's main airport. Scheduled services ran from here to London, Liverpool, Scotland, Ireland, the Isle of Man but it was beset by two problems. Firstly, it was built on an old Victorian rubbish tip, would you believe, and the ground was and in fact still is prone to move and become uneven. The second problem was the local weather. As we saw when I flew in, this little spot here is a bit prone to low cloud and mist. And so just seven years after they opened this airfield, they started building another one seven miles to the southeast of here. And that is now Manchester's main airport. The control tower here at Barton is the original and it's grade two listed. There's a balcony where the public can come and take pictures and watch the aircraft movements. Up in the visual control room, it's a FISO service, managing things on the ground and passing aerodrome information to arriving and departing traffic. It's here that I met the aerodrome manager, Liam Chadbond. So Liam, I survived the low level route. It was a bit grossy coming in here yesterday, but uh, we made it up. Does it put people off, do you find? It's often daunting, but it's not as bad as people think. PPR here is preferred online where you have a, a fairly extensive briefing website and you can pay your landing fees on there as well. Um, 
but people can ring up and pay their landing fees too. Correct. Yeah, I mean, our our team behind us always have uh, have the phones and we can answer. It's just something to bear in mind with workload in the tower. We'll usually have two or three operation staff on, um, and they can be doing the assistant role and the Pfizer in role. So if they're not able to answer the phone call straight away, uh, you might not get as quick of a response as if you would if you'd have gone online. Uh, we do have a, a one-stop shop, we call it, um, egcb80s.co.uk. That'll have your PPR, your bookouts, and your payments on there as well, tied in with our unofficial MET and any weather warnings, etc. So you can go to that one-stop website and you'll be able to book in and make your payments through there as well. So visiting pilots arriving, where are they normally told to park and, and what are the processes that they should be following? Depending on if we've got any events on or if there's a flying and we've got particularly a large amount of visiting aircraft, for fixed wing aircraft, we have three main parking areas. We have the western apron behind yourself. Uh, we have the eastern apron, uh, which is on the end of runway 32. We do have to close the runway for that, um, but often when we've got a lot of visiting aircraft, uh, we would park them uh, on the eastern apron. And then obviously you've got your main apron, which is our hard standing as well. Uh, we will prioritize that for disabled visitors or the larger aircraft, etc., that might need um, passengers, etc., to get off. So thinking about disabled um, visitors, you are a grass airfield, but as you mentioned, you have got a hard um, apron and it looks all flat to go from there wherever you need to get to. You wouldn't need to come up here to pay your exactly. landing fee because hopefully you've done it online or by phone. What about um, disabled toilets, for example? Yeah, our on-site cafe has uh, ramp access up into the cafe and disabled facilities in there. Like I said, the, the route from the parking space on the main apron is flat all the way up to the cafe. Uh, and if, if, if you want to stay here for a few days and maybe there's some weather coming through, I mean it was gusting 30 odd knots yesterday and I was quite keen to get in a hangar, you managed to sort that for me. Is that something that you can often do for people if they need that or maybe some tie downs or something? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we, we have ample grass parking. Uh, obviously the way that aircraft are going, newer aircraft these days, a lot of people would prefer the hangarage. We have um, three large hangars on site and a lot of space within those hangars so we can accommodate short term hangarage uh, for visitors, not a problem. Not so long ago, Barton was embroiled in a bit of a controversy over their strict interpretation of the rules of the air, and specifically Rule 11, which I mentioned on my arrival here. The team at Barton was reporting pilots to the CAA through the official mandatory occurrence system if they didn't abide by Rule 11. It got the aerodrome a bit of a bad reputation. I think it's fair to say you've probably educated a lot of pilots into what the rules were. Um, but you did get a lot of stick for it. Did you, did, you, did you find that pilots were, you know, not as happy to come and visit you after that? I feel like it was, it was a very small portion of people um, that were maybe vocal online. Mm. Uh, we would see a lot on the forums and on, on websites and things of people posting. Um, we saw no decline in the amount of visitors that we got. Uh, I guess for us in terms of working as a team and, and trying to do the best job that we can do and trying to abide by I guess the regulators uh, we sort of were in a bit of a sticky situation um, where we felt like we were getting a lot of personal um, not digs but if you will like in terms of we were getting a lot of personal messages against ourselves we took that quite quite to heart um, we have done a lot through education through the local airspace infringement teams and we've tried to push that message as much as possible educating pilots there's uh, there's notices on our website when you PPR with us you get an auto email with the latest sort of information to help you fly to us safely and efficiently um, and we'll try and push that and keep doing it but most of our local pilots and everyone around the area um, I, would, I would say is quite a high standard of piloting and, and local, um, local knowledge uh, so we're just trying to push that message really. I guess it's you know it was a it was necessary for the operation that you run here because you know you've got that airspace very nearby you've got a short period of time before pilots can contact you and what you didn't want and don't want is people straying into the ATZ without having you know about it or them talking to you and getting the traffic picture. That, that's, the, that's the main thing and, and the main thing for us is the safety of the pilot flying within the ATZ. We're very aware that it can be a, a, quite a hive of activity here. Um, we've got a, a huge variety of aircraft and operations going on in quite a small piece of airspace we've already got a section of our ATZ cut off by Manchester and when you confine in the the helimed the police operations with a varying amount of fixed wing aircraft and gyrocopters it can get quite complicated and I think the last thing that a pilot would want to do is be in that situation without the assistance of the FISOs knowing who they are and where they are and without and more importantly the other pilots knowing as well it's not just us getting in the information it's you announcing it to everyone on frequency effectively
So let's have a look now at what else is on offer here at Barton. In terms of fixed-wing flying schools, there's the LAC Flying School, teaching the PPL, LAPL, IRR and night ratings. Main Air Flying School offers MPPL microlight lessons. Main Air Microlight Centre teaches the NPPL in flex-wing microlights. There's also a gyrocopter school on site, a school specialising in instructor ratings and an aerobatic school as well. There are simulator experiences and, of course, the cafe, which is jolly smart looking inside. The breakfast menu ranges from toast and jam to a full English. They have their own smokehouse here. I have to say, I haven't heard of an aerodrome with a smokehouse before. Uh, the smokehouse menu includes ribs, wings, chicken and burgers. And the Sunday menu offers roast chicken, beef and vegetarian alternatives. But if you're coming to Barton, there's a good chance that you might want to explore a little further afield. Now, most airfields in the UK are situated pretty much in the majority in the middle of nowhere with no onward transport connections. That is not true of Barton. Barton is just five miles from Manchester city centre. There's even a bus stop right outside, which I think you can board a bus into the city centre and also to the Trafford Centre, which is just 10 minutes up the road. Uh, the Trafford Centre has loads of things to do, bowling alley, cinema, there's loads of restaurants and lots of shopping as well. So a great bonus for Barton. I took an Uber to my hotel. I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express Trafford City. It's a modern setup. The rooms were decorated in a contemporary style. But I have to say the whole experience was very underwhelming, with a lack of attention to cleanliness and food options limited unless you're a fan of fast food. A midweek room in the middle of winter wasn't cheap either. £160 for one night bed and breakfast. Unpleasant brown stains. Barton is a busy, popular aerodrome. From the comments on my social media pages, I can tell it's well-liked by based pilots. And apart from a perfectly reasonable expectation here that you'll abide by the rules of the air and make the required radio calls, it's a very relaxed and welcoming place to fly into. Being so close to Manchester is a real bonus as well. The cost of fuel and the circuit and landing fees are relatively average. So that concludes my visit to Barton Aerodrome. I've been here before but never flown in myself so I'm pleased that I've done it and I'm sure now I've done it I'll be back again. I've been put off by that Manchester airspace and especially that low level corridor but as you've seen there's not much to it. If you visited Barton before and you have something useful to add to this review then do put it in the comments. I'm also compiling a list of all the aerodromes that I've done video reviews for and you can find that on my website along with a map so you can search the country and pick out aerodromes you'd like to go to. And if you're an aerodrome operator or manager and would like me to come and visit your aerodrome then do get in touch. The Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review has been brought to you in association with AOPA UK, the voice of general aviation. Sign up for a new discounted membership now using the link on your screen. Fly safely, my friends.